this. Um, in this uh, talk, we are going to talk about some of the current, some of the dilemmas that we face every day uh, whenever we see a child of ptosis. You know, all the theory is given in the textbooks very nicely and all the videos can also be seen on YouTube nowadays. But uh, even with all that knowledge at our hand, sometimes we feel at loss when a patient walks in the OPD and there are some questions that creep in our mind. So I'm just trying to highlight some of those pertinent questions which normally we have, which normally I had initially, and then uh, how to go about them. So we all know congenital ptosis and it is uh, characterized by a moderate to severe kind of a ptosis. It's, the LPS action is usually fair to poor, lid lag is there on down gaze and there is absent or a weak eyelid crease. The goals of treatment that we have are to prevent amblyopia and for cosmesis. Now management options we know are still far away from perfect. We cannot make things perfect. Parents come with huge expectations to us but we have to always lower down their expectations and tell them that uh, whatever we do we cannot make this lid as natural as the normal one and they have to accept certain facts about it. And there are many debatable areas, of recent advances have been helpful to some extent although. Now these are some of the questions which we will be trying to answer. So what is the ideal timing for surgery in patients of congenital ptosis? If there is a unilateral poor levator function ptosis, which is best unilateral surgery or bilateral surgery? If we are going to perform a sling surgery, what should we use? Fascia lata should be used, silicon should be used, a suture should be used, whichever is best material, what should be used? If a child has poor bells, then what should we do? Should we operate or leave the child? Uh, what about Marcus gun? Should we excise levator or not? And what is the best method in moderate ptosis when we are doing LPS resection so that we don't have to do again a readjustment again and again? And what is the best method for mild ptosis? Now the first question is what is the ideal timing of surgery? Now if a child walks in with a problem like this, you have to look at the overall face. So this child is having chin elevation, he is having severe ptosis. Now if the child keeps his chin down, he will have amblyopia. So he is trying to compensate. Now would you like to wait for a number of years in this patient before you actually intervene? No. You would like to intervene immediately as soon as the child is fit for a general anesthesia or as soon as the child is able to hold his neck, to control his neck. So on an average we consider that you know the child's neck holding capacity becomes proper by about 9 months to 12 months of age and so that's the time when one should intervene at the earliest. In a unilateral case like this, if a child walks in with this, pupil is covered with the eyelid, toes is there in one eye, so should we wait till the child becomes 12 years of age or should we intervene immediately? The answer is immediately, as soon as you see the child because you don't want this eye to go into amblyopia. The child can see perfectly well with this eye but this, this eye will go on into suppression. If a child walks in with this kind of a ptosis, you have an MRD of about 4 in the better eye and about 1 millimeter in the other eye or 2 millimeters in the affected eye, would you like to go in immediately? No. Now this is a situation where you have to use your clinical judgment as to how urgent it is. So basically here the concern is just cosmesis. Here you can easily wait till the child is elder and able to cooperate with what you are doing. And you need to counsel the parents accordingly. That is the most crucial part of ptosis management. The next question is uh, what is the best material for sling, what, what do you do in unilateral uh, poor levator function ptosis, do a unilateral or bilateral surgery and what about poor bells, whether to operate or not. Now all these three questions are kind of interconnected. Now we know there are many, uh, many materials which have been tried till now, sutures, fascia lata, till now fascia lata was considered to be the material of choice as the gold standard. There are many surgeons still who would swear by fascia lata as to uh, uh, the, be most comfortable with this technique. But there are some drawbacks with using fascia lata. One is difficulty of obtaining fascia lata. Sometimes in very small kids you don't get a sufficient amount of material and uh, you're also creating another scar on the thigh. So patient ends up getting scars in two places, eye, eyelid as well as thigh. Now why do we prefer silicon nowadays? It's because it's easily available, cheap, inert, it's got its own innate it, elasticity to some extent and uh, it's very easy to adjust and remove as the child grows and there's no need of any other incision elsewhere on the body. 
Uh, we did a silicon rod study when I was doing my fellowship in LVPI and we studied 81 eyes of 59 patients with average age of 0.5 to 50 years and median follow-up was uh, about 6 months with a range of 3 months to 42 months. And this is what we observed that uh, there was a significant uh, correction of ptosis which is obvious but the good part was lack of thalamus at the end of follow-up period was just about 1 millimeter in most of these kids. And recurrence rate was also just about 8 percent. Now when we looked at the outcome we found that uh, about 77 percent patients or 78 percent patients had excellent or good cosmetic outcome with the use of silicon rod. And the outcome was obviously as expected as we were also expecting that it was better when we operated both eyes simultaneously rather than a unilateral uh, surgery. But even in unilateral group you can see that 70 percent of these kids had good or excellent cosmetic outcome. But obviously bilateral surgery would be preferred in these cases. Complications were rare. Uh, transient SPKs, microbial keratitis and sometimes forehead granulomas were there. Now this is a, a brief video. Why is this not working here? Yeah. So this is uh, demonstrate the technique of uh, the surgery. First thing is that we put 4-0 silk sutures on the lid margin to pull and stretch the lid and keep it taut. And then two small incisions are given on the upper lid skin along the superior uh, along the medial and the lateral limbus and then three incisions are given on the forehead. One is medial suprabrow incision, small stab incision there, one lateral suprabrow incision and one is central forehead incision which is in line with the pupillary axis and silicon rod which comes with a pre-fitted uh, pre kind of a needle, it's a very sharp needle, easily malleable, is, it's very useful and it goes from the central forehead incision passing through the frontalis. We exit it along the lateral supra, supra brow incision and then we take it into the eyelid and exit in the incision close to the lid margin which we made initially. Here the trick is to pass it a little deep not to keep the sling very superficial otherwise it will show when the child looks down. You must confirm that no part of the sling is visible from the conjunctival side, it has not perforated the conjunctiva otherwise the child may have problems related to cornea. And then similar passes are made on the way back from medial eyelid incision back to the medial supra brow incision again a little at a deep, little deeper level passing deep to the septum so that the contour of the eyelid remains even and you don't see any evidence of sling visible. If you pass it very superficially you can always see the skin lying subcutaneously. Again very important to see any perforation of the conjunctiva and then the needle exits through the central forehead incision and then there is a sleeve which is provided with the sling and with this sleeve we can actually adjust the height of the eyelid margin to wherever we desire. Normally we keep it a little above the expected level at the time of surgery if the Bell's phenomena is good in a particular patient because after surgery it tends to droop down a little bit by about 1.5 or 2 millimeters at times. So it's best to just a little bit overcorrect it on table and then the incisions can be closed by one or two sutures and a frost suture is then applied. So this is a kind of uh, result that we can get if we do a bilateral congenital uh, bilateral sling surgery in the in one go. This is again a ch another child who underwent bilateral surgery, another child who underwent a unilateral surgery in the right eye, another child who underwent unilateral surgery. It can be done both ways. You have to talk to the parents. You have to see what they are most comfortable with. Obviously, bilateral surgery would provide you better cosmesis and better contour. Now we noticed that lack of thalamus is very less in these patients after using uh, silicon sling and uh, so this was a patient who came with congenital fibrosis syndrome, a young college going student very concerned about the way he was looking and he wanted something to be done desperately. He had absolutely no ocular movements and zero bells. Now even in this patient he is very comfortable with this uh, sling. Otherwise without this kind of an elasticity in this material we wouldn't have been able to give him any 
uh, correction. Another patient who had a congenital third nerve palsy and uh, was very, very adamant, very desperate to get something done for raising the eyelid. And uh, again, silicon was the best thing to be used in such cases. Now, moving on to the next part, which is the best method to correct moderate congenital ptosis, which requires minimum resurgeries. Right. Let's just go through first the steps of a conventional LPS resection surgery. We give a lid crease incision. These are traction sutures. The skin crease incision passes through skin, then we go through the orbicularis. Radio frequency cautery helps to minimize the bleeding. Next comes septum. Septum is in size next. Fat prolapses out, which tells you you are in the right plane, and right under the fat lies LPS aponeurosis. Tarsal plate is exposed. Subconjunctival xylocaine is injected to create a plane between the conjunctiva molars and the levator. Anchoring sutures are passed through the levator aponeurosis close to the attachment on the tarsus. The aponeurosis is separated from the tarsal attachments and with the, with the help of a swab stick and a blunt dissection, the separation is carried out superiorly and with 360 proline sutures we tend to advance the levator aponeurosis onto the tarsal plate as per the prescribed nomograms. Now they are nomograms which you all must be aware of by beards. And then this part, whatever is redundant levator aponeurosis, it is excised. Now this is the standard technique of uh, doing levator resection surgery. This is fine for very young kids where we cannot do any modification or, or very young children who won't be able to cooperate for any OPD kind of adjustment. But in slightly elder children, say around 10 years, 12 years, who are more cooperative, we can do a slight modification in the sense that uh, uh, this is a video, but uh, I think we're running out of time. So what we do is there are sutures which pass through a uh, tarsal plate and instead of just passing from through the levator aponeurosis, we don't tie them there and then. Instead, we pass each end of these two sutures through the orbicularis on either side of the incision. One end passes through the superior end of the incision through the orbicularis and the other end passes through the inferior end of the orbic inferior end of the incision or through the orbicularis. And then these three sutures, they are left long and not tied right there on the table, but they are left long and the skin incision is then closed. One week later when edema settles and you want to now lift the eyelid, you can simply tighten these sutures in the OPD and you can keep the lid at the desired level. Once you've done this, then you can simply cut these long sutures and they, you can just push the knots under the skin. So this is a technique which can actually reduce uh, taking the patient again and again in the OT for adjustments, provided the patient is cooperative enough. Obviously, it has to be done in a slightly elder child or an individual, uh, not in very young in patients. Yes. Now, if you do a, either a standard or a, a, this adjustable levator resection, results are usually very, very good. In fact, wherever possible, one should try to go for levator resection rather than sling surgery because the contour and the kind of shape that you get with levator resection is not possible with any other technique. Now, moving on to mild ptosis, uh, the, my preferred approach is mullerectomy. Dr. Mandeep is sitting here, I know he's very good at levator plication, but uh, what we prefer is mullerectomy. In this, for these cases, we prefer cases which have a positive phenylephrin test. Now, what phenylephrin does is simulates the Miller's muscle and contracts the Muller's muscle. So you can beforehand preoperatively judge which patient is going to benefit with uh, mullerectomy. If the patient shows a good response, if you see a two millimeter lift 
after putting 2.5% phenylephrine, then you know that this patient is a good candidate for correcting the 2 millimeter ptosis with the mullerectomy uh, surgery. Sometimes it can be even be necessary to do something more than what was done in a prior unsuccessful external approach ptosis surgery and here also this technique comes handy. What we do is we evert the eyelid and we pass uh, sutures, these are sutures through the conjunctiva and this is the Putterman's mullerectomy clamp which comes uh, and it clamps the conjunctiva Muller's complex. <coughs> you've inverted the lid on Desmar's retractor, you catch hold of the conjunctiva and Muller's. Now you, you pass some catgut sutures or vicryl sutures just below the level of this clamp which will help to approximate or rather advance the cut edge of Muller's onto the tarsus and then whatever tissue is clamped in this, uh, uh, in this um, clamp that, that you can ex remove. Uh, nomogram that we follow is about 4 millimeters of Muller's muscle to be excised for 1 millimeter correction of ptosis. So if you are correcting 2 millimeter of ptosis, you need to take out at least 8 to 9 millimeter of Muller's and conjunctiva. For very mild ptosis, it's very useful technique. There is no external scar also. Okay. And then the last part is Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomena. Uh, again, there is a debate uh, whether you do unilateral or a bilateral surgery or whether you excise levator or not. This was a study conducted by Dr. Seema and she has tried to show that uh, simply doing a sling surgery works as good as excising the levator. In about 58 percent of cases she got good results with just doing a sling surgery and not even excising uh, the levator's muscle. We are also getting some good results and probably we will compile our data and maybe this can be published later. Uh, blepharophimosis is also been discussed by Dr. Seema. This runs in families and what we need to correct is uh, the medial canthus and the ptosis. Here we have done a CU plasty and a frontalis ling. I prefer to do both in one sitting and I have not observed any significant difference when you do it in one sitting or in two sittings. So to conclude, ptosis remains one of uh, the most controversial areas in oculoplasty still even after so many years. And uh, what we should try is we should take a judicious, judicious decision taking into account patient's expectation, parent's expectations, explaining everything at every step and uh, counselling, counselling, counselling. This is the most important thing whenever you are dealing with patients of ptosis because they are kids, their parents are really apprehensive. You need to do a lot of counselling with them. That is the most important part. Thank you very much.